Okay, folks, uh, we want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar on Radical KM and, and innovation. We're excited to get started in just a minute. So without further ado, let me hand this over to our hosts and I'll uh, stop share here in a second. We have Stephanie Barnes, who is an author, consultant, and a KMI instructor. And we have Kate Pugh, who is an author, consultant, and lecturer at Columbia University and Tufts University. So let me go ahead and hand it over to you ladies and I'll stop share and thank you for hosting today. Great, thank you. Thank you. I will share my window here and we can get going. Start our little meerkat. So yeah, thank you for joining us today. Kate and I are going to talk to you about um, radical KM or radical curiosity, sorry, about innovation practices and skills for the 21st century, something desperately needed, um, recalling our humanity. So let's just step back from the AI for a few minutes. If you've attended one of my sessions before, you know I like to start off by sort of grounding and centering and getting focused and do a guided visualization. So if you're someplace safe and comfortable and you want to close your eyes and follow along, please do that. If you're not someplace safe and comfortable um, and you don't want to do this, just listen as we as I read as I do this. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to you're someplace quiet and can join us in closing our eyes now and taking a slow, deep breath. Picture in your mind's eye, a small and delicate flower. Floating gently inside your skull. Just behind the bone of your forehead. Notice the flower's color, its shape, the pattern of its petals. Let the flower drift slowly downward, gently gliding down your throat into your rib cage, drifting down and down between your lungs, downward, gently downward coming to rest in the lowest place in your abdomen. The place where your breath reaches when you breathe fully and deeply. A quiet touch of color deep in the darkness of your abdomen. Hold the flower there. Hold it. Hold it. Now let it go. Let the flower vanish. But stay focused on the place where it was deep down in the dark center of you. Focus on the darkness. Now, when you're ready, and only when you're ready, open your eyes and come back into a virtual room. So, thank you. Um, I'd like to pause here while everyone collects themselves and come, comes back into our virtual room. If you'd like to share something in the um, chat window, a reflection on what that, how that was for you, um, how that felt, if you liked it, if you didn't like it, um, please feel free to share. If you don't want to share, and that's fine too, of course. Um, and as I said at the start, I like to start my sessions off with that just because we're jumping from meeting to meeting to meeting. For me, it's I'm in Berlin. Um, it's already late in the afternoon, so I've already had a bunch of meetings. So it's nice just to calm down and center before I share this session with you. So who am I? Um, I have an undergrad in accounting and an MBA in IT. Um, I evolved into being a knowledge management consultant 24 years ago, almost 25, um, while I was at Hewlett Packard. Um, I've been an independent consultant for 20, uh, almost 20 years of that. 
I am also an artist and painter, um, which is what informs radical knowledge management, and I'm Canadian based in Berlin. And Kate? And Stephanie, it is a joy to be with you. I am Kate Pugh or Katrina Pugh, and I am on the faculty at both Columbia and Tufts universities. Um, I have probably interacted with almost everybody on the call and what a joy it is to see you there today. Um, I have been a manager, I've been a consultant, I've been um, an author, and I even add in here that I've been a musician and Stephanie should have amplified that because she is an extraordinary artist. Um, so it's, it's great to be here and thank you for welcoming me. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kate. And yeah, I'm excited to do this session with you too. So innovation. What are we trying to do with innovation? We're trying to coordinate the uncoordinated. We're trying to create something out of nothing. Um, we're doing maybe what's inconsistent with what people expect, sort of like doing arts-based interventions in your knowledge management program, <laughs> not what most people would expect. Um, there's lots of, of things that, that sort of influence or we can think about when we're talking about innovation goals or objectives. Um, a lot of times when people get caught up in the, the rule that, you know, or the, the rule that they think exists that they have to play with what's in front of them. Um, and that real rule doesn't really exist. It exists in board games and, you know, like checkers, <laughs> but in, in life and in innovation, it's about, um, you know, maybe putting a new piece on the board or taking a piece off um, and seeing what happens. So this is an arts-based interventions are our way of, of fueling that, um, of supercharging that if, if you ask me. But, and so radical curiosity, um, what Kate and I are talking about today is, is taking those arts-based interventions and systematically um, introducing novel thoughts. And so talking about how this, what this looks like on a group, um, group work, perspective, the conversation and the, the strategic thinking that that's um, enabled and enlivened um, through the arts based interventions. Now, radical curiosity and radical KM may seem counterintuitive. This I know, <laughs> I've been talking about creativity and arts based interventions. And I should say before I go too much further, I often use them interchangeably they're really not, they're two different things. Creativity is, is actually much broader than curiosity. Creativity tends to also include creative thinking, creative problem solving, um, and beyond arts. Um, and I tend to focus on the, the arts part of the, of the equation. So um, just know that, that it's really not a one-to-one a -one, um, match there. So, so arts-based interventions may seem counterintuitive um, to a lot of you, um, but they're not. They're really actually practical, especially in this day and age when we're trying to, to be innovative and keep up with you know, the changing world. And so on an individual basis, we're looking at, we're talking about arts-based intervention as idea generators. It's not about painting a painting or creating an artwork that's going to show in an art gallery someplace, although maybe if you're lucky, your organization will create a little gallery in, in one of their offices and um, to show off the, the, the works of art. Um, but it's really about the process of creating art, um, not the end product. And then so that systematically introduced um, the opportunity for working with novel thoughts and, and ideas on an individual basis. Taking that to a team or a group basis then is, is taking those ideas and working with them together using conversation and strategic thinking as, as the, the connecting point and holding open the, the synapses for, for innovation. We're going to talk a bit more about the neuroscience in a second. So again, a bit more on the, the individual side of, of things. Why do we need to relearn creativity? Why should we be doing arts-based interventions in our organizations? because well, it's been educated out of us for one thing. Certainly it was educated out of me and a lot of people that I've talked to over the, the years. And yet this light bulb came on when I started to paint uh, 12 years ago now. I was like, 
oh, this is so much fun. And that gave me all of these ideas and things, different ways of looking at things and different questions to ask. Um, and so this has been educated out of us. We're so focused on planning and filling up our every moment of every day with something analytical, some kind of, you know, some deliverable um, or some meeting. We've got to be filled. If we don't have something in our calendar, we're not being productive. Um, like we're, we're working in some kind of a, a production line, like a, or a factory manufacturing cars um, or manufacturing, you know, equipment. But knowledge work, which is what we are all doing, we're all knowledge workers to some degree, whether we have knowledge management in our title or, or not, or knowledge manager in our title or not, we're all managing knowledge. Everything we do is about knowledge work at, at this point in the, the 21st century and has been for a while. And so creativity really is, is part of knowledge creation, the knowledge creation process. And and we need to, to remember that, not just focus on trying to write everything down out of our, our heads. And so relearning this this creativity that's been educated out of us is, is key. And I know there's a lot of benefits on this this post or on the slide. You know, I look at it and go, oh, there's so many things. It seems like creativity and, and arts are some kind of panacea because it does everything. But when you think about it, um, it does. It, it informs everything. It's part, it's one half, it's the other side of the, the coin. Um, we've focused on being analytical and rational and logical and there's nothing wrong with that, but we're missing out on the whole creativity side. So that's why there's so many benefits to, to creativity. So, and it promotes thinking, creative thinking and, and problem solving. It helps link you to, to other people that have the same passion. And as knowledge managers, something we should be concerned about, it encourages us and our fellow colleagues um, to be lifelong learners. So something, you know, there's, there's a lot here going on that, that as knowledge managers, we should be paying attention to and helping our organizations enable um, in, to, to be better balanced, to be more sustainable in the way that we're working. One way to do this, or one of the things I like to talk about uh, around creativity is creating rituals, creating some habits and routines around creativity, bringing them into part of our, making them part of our meetings, making them part of how we're doing our, our work. So, and that can be rituals around playing, it could be arts and crafts, um, it could be storytelling. Um, you know, lots of us are working at home. We can talk about cooking as a creative outlet, having games, you know, having some fun. Whoops. Um, yeah, having playing some games, having some fun, and and making space for reflection and um, contemplation. So I know you're probably thinking, oh no, she's telling us something else we've got to do. There's already so many things we've got to do. I have the top 10 things to do before 10 a.m. in the morning list someplace. Um, we've got all these emails, we've got all these tweets and LinkedIn requests. And if it's spring, which it is right now, um, tax returns. I know in the US, you guys have just finished your tax returns and same in Canada. Um, I think the German tax returns are due at the end of May. Um, you know, so there's all this, this stuff to do. And that's even before you know, we really get into the serious work stuff. How are we going to deal with this overload? What should we do about this? Well, don't worry. <laughs> or at least take a breath and, and realize that our brains can, can change. Our brains are, the neuroplasticity of our brains means that they can change and adapt to our, our situations and that paying attention um, to any particular connection um, helps keep the circuitry open and alive and helps grow and, and strengthen it. Um, and, and attention helps feed that. Um, it helps us to engage with novelty. Um, and again, it comes back to attention and, and paying attention and practicing, um, which also goes a long way to explain why I have not mastered German because um, I don't practice enough. Back to art though, um, art combines with the neuroplasticity of our brains to inspire innovation, to help 
make new connections. It gets us out of that rut, out of our comfort zones, out of the boxes that we spend all day in and asks us to try something different, to experiment. What happens when I put those two colors together or what happens when I try and balance this pen on top of this coffee mug um, you know if we're making a sculpture making sculptures out of stuff on our desk is one of the activities that I do so you know it encourages to to be playful and to have some fun and to try new new things so and that's feeding the, the neuroplasticity and that book your brain on art I have to highly recommend it talks about all the benefits of art on our brains and that we have really, really been missing out and selling ourselves short. So if you're looking for a book to add to your uh, reading list, I highly recommend that one. And now, Kate, it's your turn to talk about teams and groups. Oh, this is so great. Well, one thing I would also add, just as we're grump- jumping into this, is you said, oh, you got too many things on your plate. How are you going to put into place these rituals? Well, our brains are plastic, meaning that we can change the way we spend our time. We can also change the way we react. At the same time, those rituals can help us with the changing process. So this isn't really just simply, oh, I can make space, so therefore I can do my rituals. It's, I have these rituals, so I'm now making space. They are the ones that give us the ability to hold open those synapses and to change the routines in our minds, which are basically for you who love neuroscience. We tend to have a very high energy part of our brain called the PFC, prefrontal cortex, which works with the medial temporal lobes to classify and collect information. And it's way too exhausting. And so we quickly move things into our basal ganglia. That's where the habits live. But if we have too much in habits, we don't even have access to them. We get back into routines. What arts practices do is help us hold open that transfer process longer so that we can do something different, something novel. So Stephanie just talked about how we can do it as individuals. What we're gonna do is talk now about how can we bring this into the organization and if you will, create deliberate emergence. So use deliberate access to those very processes at the group level so that the creativity leads to innovations. That's new products, new services, new approaches to solving problems, and as KMers, new cuts on knowledge from novel places. So let's go to the next slide. So the benefits for the organization of these arts-based activities are that we can see things that we could not see We can imagine our company as we could not imagine it. We can imagine our values as they haven't been, but we might desire them to be. And we can improve our cohesion because as humans, we are genetically inclined for art. We have grown up as cultural beings, grown up, I should say. We've evolved from the primordial ooze to cultural beings, and that is who we are. So when we are cultural beings together, we are one. So let's look at the next slide here. We're gonna talk about a deliberate process, which I'm gonna call deliberate emergence, called dialogue. I'm also gonna call it conversation. Conversation and dialogue are very, very close. Traditionally, dialogue is something that involves a non-judgmental engagement where people are suspending judgment, respecting each other, and engaging in deep listening. In effect, when we're in dialogue and whether we're doing it here on Zoom or we're doing it in a circle, we're basically turning to each other and we're letting meaning flow through. There is less obstruction to meaning in dialogue than there is in discussion, which has its roots from the same thing as percussion, which means to break. Dialogue means flow. And When we are in dialogue, we're holding the space for each other, which is very much synonymous with what Stephanie was just saying. We're holding open, if you will, the metaphorical synapses of the group for the possibility of new solutions to problems to emerge. And if we pay attention while we're doing that, if we sit there and we say, oh, this is really interesting, we're not jumping to a conclusion, 
we have the very real possibility of reconfiguring our decisions. So let's talk a little bit even more practically about how we go about that. Next slide. So this kind of um, dialogue practice involves saying things to each other about how we're making that field happen. So let's imagine that Stephanie and Lori and Brandon and Eric and I are in conversation. And I'm basically saying, I am holding this space so that you can kind of take a risk or I'm scaffolding. In other words, I'm giving you some topics and I'm, I'm hopefully not using topics which are considered weird. You're seeing the topics and saying, oh, thank you. Thank you for keeping me on track or thank you for pulling out of me what I didn't even know that I knew, right? Um, and I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to kind of get access to something that might be controversial. That's the diversity. And then I'm also helping with new encoding and knowledge managers, this should look extremely familiar. This is about um, kind of retrieving the knowledge in people and helping make it available at scale. So new encoding is thinking about, okay, so all right, what way do we wanna encode this in us? And what way do we wanna say, oh, this is a new way, a new habit for us together. This might be a new meeting ritual. Um, or in what way do we want to spread it across time with documents, websites, search taxonomies? This new encoding could be very, very different from the way we typically do a KM program when we're engaging in dialogue. And the arts-based process gives us access to dialogue and gives us access to those fields where we hold open possibilities. Let's go to the next slide. Again, let's keep on, oh, sorry. <laughs> so my little metaphor here <laughs> is that conversation is like yoga for the brain. Dialogue and conversation used interchangeably are like yoga for the brain. So what we're doing is we're kind of giving everybody in the organization an opportunity to do at a very broad level, non-judgmental access to innovation. Um, and when I say conversation is like yoga for the brain, as we're in conversation and we're not jumping to conclusions, getting back to our, you saw that planner image that Stephanie showed, getting back to our task list, we're really getting more possibilities for solving specific problems about our organization. So there's my metaphor, yoga for the brain. And let's, let's talk about a little bit more how. Okay, so, no, oh, no, keep going. Um, so when we are with individuals in our organization as knowledge practitioners or as any kind of innovators, we could be talking to customers. We could be saying, what are the jobs to be done? If any of you guys have seen the work of InnoSight or Clayton Christensen, he talks about jobs to be done only that can be revealed in conversation with a customer or a stand-in for a customer. But if you really want to help that customer find what they know, you don't want to disrupt their memory. You don't want to compete. You don't want to say, how well do you like this kind of potato chip? Instead, you want to say, tell us what you're hankering for. That's a very different way of giving them access. So we don't wanna disrupt their memory. And we all know we've been in conversations with people in a tacit knowledge collection process where they've been like, I, didn't, I don't know, I don't know how to do this, but we're doing this obstruction because we're not thinking about how to support them, how to support them holding open those synapses. What empowers their memory could be um, filtering out competing stimuli. You know, let's say that um, they remember things in, in nice tidy chevrons that go in a row because that's the way they encoded their memory of a process. So don't show them chevrons that you made up. Let them start showing you what their chevrons are. Let them start showing you what their process is. Um, and maybe you wanna use cues and maybe you wanna sort of help scaffold it in a way that, um, you use chevrons, but then you let them fill them in. 
Conversely, they might not like chevrons at all. They might not memorize things in chevrons. They might memorize things in hierarchies or systems. See if you can learn from them how to collect their, help them collect themselves, help them recall how they recalled. So in this kind of deliberate process, this kind of deliberate emergence, when we're working with people to help them innovate, we have to be on the same page as them and we have to get rid of these disruptors. Next slide. In my own research, I look at the way conversation can be conducive to innovation. And specifically, I've spent time coding conversations for specific what we call um, rhetorical intent. Um, these five rhetorical intents plus this sort of nasty snarky thing are common across all conversations. And if we can start being aware of how rhetorical intent plays out over time and results in innovation, we can supply some of this rhetorical intent. So let me just say what we've got going on here. Integrity is making statements. Integrity Q is asking questions, inquiring. Courtesy is being positive and respectful. Inclusion is acknowledging people or maybe even saying, at Brandon, good to see you today. Can you add something? to this conversation. So you can imagine doing this asynchronously. Translation is synthesizing. And of course, Snarky is doing none of those things or doing them very poorly. In my research, I've seen that the more integrity cue and the more translation, the more likely a group will start generating options. So the more questions and the more sort of synthesis or summarization, somebody saying, oh, we came from here to here to here. You guys on the same page? This is where we're going. So we looked at this particular set of problems and those problems, and we started generating an option. This is where we are today. That summarization coupled with the questions are conducive to options generation. And I'll also have you know that courtesy and inclusion correlate with the likelihood that people will say they're gonna take action. So my research got some really quantitative results from that. So if you have a 10 percentage increase in inclusion in the conversation, it correlates to a 45% increase in the likelihood of people saying that they will intend to act. If you have a 10% increase in courtesy, you'll get a 35% increase in the likelihood of intent to act. More on that if you're interested. Don't need to be too detailed here. Suffice it to say, that these approaches to creating conversation, this way of creating emergence in a group deliberately can really give us access to those innovative outcomes that Stephanie was describing. In fact, the content of the conversation can be some of those rituals that she was elaborating on earlier. Let's go to the next slide and I can show you one very kind of concrete implementation of those five discussion disciplines. So many of you are aware of strategic planning. Probably fewer of you are aware of this thing called strategic thinking. So strategic thinking is a mindset. And what it's basically doing is saying, what are the practices the organization can use to access that broader creativity? This is written by uh, Jean Lietka. I really commend to you her work on this. There are a couple of other researchers on strategic thinking. But the five practices are to kind of be aligned on where we're going, that's called intent focused, to be driven by curiosity and questions, there's the radical curiosity illusion, that's hypothesis driven, to be respectful of analogies and cases and examples that people have used or bring to the conversation or to the table, we call that thinking in time, Having a systems perspective, many of you guys are systems thinkers, you're aware of this. What this does is introduce the possibility of non-intuitive outcomes and then intelligent opportunism, which is kind of extrapolating. You can probably tell that I gave you this slide right after the previous slide because intent focused is often using integrity declarations, hypothesis driven, often using questions, which is integrity cue. 
thinking in time is often found in statements of courtesy, meaning I respect what you did in the past. And systems perspective is about including things, including the non-intuitive, including the unexpected, including a diverse lens. So there's that inclusion. And intelligent opportunism is saying, therefore, let's do this. Therefore, let's project our talents and our organizational competencies forward. And that is similar to translation. So we made the statement that dialogue is a great way of holding open those synapses collectively, including the opportunity of bringing in the novel, that dialogue practices or conversation practices can be deliberate and they have measurable outcomes. And we said that strategic thinking is an application of those, those dialogue practices, those discussion disciplines, and they in turn can result in a more innovative approach to strategy and more innovative approach to design. And by the way, this doesn't mean that you have to be sitting in a boardroom. We do strategy as knowledge practitioners all the time when we're thinking about direction. Let's go to the next slide. So, You've heard about things you can do as an individual to start introducing creativity into your practice. And you've heard a little bit about the general kinds of improvements to conversations and improvements to your strategic planning process, shall I say, your strategic thinking practice process. And you've also had an opportunity to calm yourself and come into this space where we have new things happening. Now I question for you, Stephanie and I wrote this question and you can say it out loud or you can write it in the text. What have you done in the last week to open to the possibility of novelty? What have you done in the last week to open to the possibility of novelty? And I can paraphrase that what kind of crazy things did you do this past week that you wouldn't have normally did? And how were the amazing results? And please feel free to come off mute. This is not just about Stephanie and me flapping our tongues. <laughs> oh, Nathan. Nathan says, I asked my seven-year-old how he thinks. Oh, I saw it on the chat and then I lost it. I uh, asked him how he thinks black holes work. Sometimes he catches me watching Nova. Uh, that's oh, good. Question. Um, but I find that he's got a lot of perspectives that are just, they're so fresh, like you guys are talking about. He's so open to innovation that he doesn't know what the concept is. It's just how his mind works. Um, so it's uh, it's very interesting. I run I run a lot of stuff by him. So uh, that perspective, it's, it's very cool to understand what is the art of the possible. Um, I truly believe that if you ask uh, the students in first through sixth grade or kindergarten through sixth grade problems of the world, they probably could solve it if we would just listen. They make connections. And I see Joel said, I practice um, contact improv dance in Montreal. Oh, what a joy. Nice. Painted my living room lilac. Holly, we want photos. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephanie Rothfix said, um, it's a good reminder of opening to the possibility of novelty. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I tried I some new recipes for coffee, just making like fancy coffees, like the ones that you get on Starbucks and got good results. <laughs> oh, Claudia, yum. I'm going to come visit you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please come. <laughs> Pauline, I think you just said you did, um, you did some networking and that was just a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Taking Meeting. pictures of spring. Mm -hmm. 
physical exercise. Monica, hooray for you. Anybody else? Open to the possibility of novelty. Oh my goodness, Clara, that sounds wonderful. She made homemade cinnamon rolls. <gasps> oh, Claire, where do you live? <laughs> I'm in London, unfortunately, but I'll try and send some over. <laughs> yeah, Berlin's not too far. Exactly. <laughs> oh, you've got a lot of people that are res were responding. I see a heart there, Claire. I'm interested if any of you have also opened it to the possibility of novelty in a group, in a team that you um, participate in. Anybody who's done it in a group, and by the way, it is kosher for you to just come right off of mute, blurt things out. <laughs> Nate has said, I'm in the information and knowledge strategy master's program where there's a lot of novelty. It's a, it's a program that I teach in. Very diverse. Diverse and then also the conversations go to many, many different disciplines. So now here's another question. How many of you in your groups have examined the kind of language you use in your conversations and the degree to which that language opens you up to novelty or closes you down? Doing belly breathing with my group. Is that breathing, Joel? Or are you, are you making belly bread? <laughs> I think it's breathing, right? That's great. So with your group doing belly breathing, other people, what have you done with your team, with your club? with your community, with your family, Nate, maybe with your son, to change the nature of the conversation towards creativity, towards novelty. Morning, Kate. Can you hear me? I can, that's Christine. Hi, uh, I would like to be able to um, say that I've, I've literally quoted some of the work that you've done around discussions and how to keep them productive uh, with the team that I'm working with right now. Um, sometimes I have been finding that when folks make declarative statements, they're unaware that they're shutting down conversation. And so being able to sort of use the, um, the work that you've done to uh, create sort of a, a lattice for us to get away from those conversations shutting down and more towards productivity has been really helpful. So yeah, I use groups great. all the time, yeah. That is great. So just being conscious. And I see Claire putting the thumb up there. Safe spaces, Claire, good for you. So maybe including that positivity, which is what we call courtesy, or inclusion, which is acknowledgement. Is that right? Um, yeah, I, I find that um, just to try and encourage people that it's okay to, um, well, it's just that it, it's safe for people to be able to um, contribute to conversations and that you know they're not sort of second guessing that perhaps what they're going to say is 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 wrong or you know a bit, a bit different in in the discussions to try and develop our some of our content creation and, and our knowledge knowledge journey together so um so yeah that's a bit of a working practice for me but hopefully hopefully kind of get in there and i guess it's it's all about relationship building as well for 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 me and, and with those people too that's, that is a great example. I think 
somebody just raised their hand. I think that was Nate. Did you raise your hand, Nate? Yeah, uh, just I think it groups. I'm a big biomimetic systems person. So uh, if people are feeling stuck or something, the answer is out there, you know, literally. So even if they don't know kind of what they're looking for, they might stumble across something that inspires them or a, a metaphor that they can see and explore further. Um, and then also, I mean, I think nature's perfected most things. So since I'm reinventing the wheel. It's a great idea. And the idea of um, knowing that it's out there, having that kind of um, willingness to not jump, that's called suspending. That's what Stephanie called being open to, staying open to new possibilities. Claudia, I see you've got your hand up too. Yes, thank you, Kate. Um, I wanted to say that, I mean, the, this, this, this discussion really resonates with me, the idea that, yes, conversations, they are very, so important, but that, what is it that you said, that building the team's ability to innovate is also plastic, um, meaning it's a learning process. It's not because you said, okay, let's be innovative or let's have like um, generative discussions that's going to happen. And so I love the slide that you have, like those those steps have been being kind, being, I don't remember the space, but they resonated so much. And in our team, um, a colleague of mine and I, Zarko and I, uh, we, we always, I mean, when we are in a team together, we always try to introduce a few practices to view those generative conversations. And two of those that, 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 that I mean, work, of course, within time is one to establish like check-ins uh, before meeting starts, just having like a, a moment to check in. And for that, we use like check-in questions. These are informal questions and you can choose the level of spiciness, right? If it's, if it's, you were just warming up, it could be something like the weather, but then you can really get started to know the team members better when you start with more personal questions, uh, more challenging questions and, and that works. And the other one that was important in especially one of the teams that the discussions were really not flowing was to use like a circle, meaning give space for everybody to speak. Um, and we would say that people didn't have to, of course, when, when your time came, you, you could say I pass, but we, we opened this space for everybody to, to speak. And that was important because we need like an equalizer in that particular team. You would be delighted to see the research on effective teams shows that the teams that have the highest levels of productivity and the highest ability to kind of meet their team objectives are the ones that do turn taking and also that have a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversations laterally, not just one-on-one -on -one conversations with their PM project manager. Um, and that's the reason we, we took that slide out because we thought we'd overwhelm you guys. But that research was taking place at the Center for Collective Intelligence at MIT by Tom Malone and Anita Willey. Good, really good research. Um, I think I just saw somebody else raise a hand. Andrew, was that you? Andrew Trickett, did you have a comment to make? Yes. Um... And apologies for any loud purring you can hear. My pussycat has decided that she's going to, she wants to contribute to this as well. So she's sitting here purring away. So apologies if you know, she probably make more sense. I think it's safe spaces up to a point. I think one of the best, you know, the best ideas you want to encourage robust discussion. You want to encourage the wild idea. And I think the best ideas come from that robust but respectful challenge i think one of the biggest problems sometimes is we don't reflect um my late father always he drummed it into me he said you know whenever somebody comes up with an idea and a thought take a step back and say what are we missing here always ask yourself what are we missing here because he found he was an engineer and he found by experience that the first expressed idea that everyone went along with was never the best idea so it's just taking that step back that ref you've talked about reflection. It's just taking that, that little step back and just say, what am I missing here? That's a, that's a great 
um, is a gift. It's a gift that you can offer. Um, and I think I just saw somebody just said, use silence. Um, and I'm having trouble with my keyboard. That was Joel who was saying, use silence. Um, and maybe Stephanie, if you could turn back to the slides with the funky faces on them, the, um, the um, discussion disciplines, this is what Claudia was just referring to. So recognizing that when these are way out of balance, like you've got way too many questions, too much integrity queue, you're kind of grilling people or you've got people doing too much translation and like you don't have enough time for people to kind of put out new ideas. Suddenly we're kind of challenging, we're racing, what's the word? We're, we're um, barreling towards the close with a summary or too much integrity, which is what Claudia said. That's basically too much declaration. While it's certainly well-intended, it might be perceived as going faster than everyone's been able to digest it or incorporate other ideas. Great. Shall we recap? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So, and we'll take some more questions too after we do the recap. But, but so we've just spent the last uh, almost hour talking about our brains being plastic and flexible, and how art, you know, can help us be even more, you know, or support that flexibility um, and and support making new connections um, both through individual and collective um, innovation systems um, and how to, to radically include, um, improve them through the use of arts-based interventions. All of this is, is here and now, it's happening among us, around us, to us, um, and it, it it's fundamental to our humanity though that the arts and the creativity and and I feel like I'm having a lot of conversations lately with people about about our humanity about you know taking a step back from from all the technology that's running our lives and 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 recalling strengthening the the parts of us that are are human the, the our creativity and our need to connect and be social and, and have conversations with people. So just as a, as we send you off into the world, well, we're gonna do some questions, but as we send you off into the world after the questions, um, think about some creativity rituals that you can do as you know, for yourself, as an individual, or as your, your group, um, and, and ways to have, um, better conversations within your group and, and possibly, you know, leveraging those, those arts-based interventions. And now we're going to take some questions. And just as we do that, um, I will share the contact info for, for myself and for Kate. Um, our email addresses, feel free to connect to us on, on LinkedIn. And um, we set up a, a website for this. So if you're curious so we'll take a look at some of the um, related materials um, take a you can go to that that URL radical curious radical curiosity dot studio so now back to the questions I'm going to unshare my screen so that I can see everybody there excellent so do we have any more questions we got a few minutes left Questions or kind of expressions of intent. Yeah. Yeah. So how many of you are thinking, am I going to open up the possibility of novelty? Are we going to open up the possibility of novelty? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just taking us out of the linear processes in our lives. Yeah, we don't have to be so serious all the time. Right? We don't have to be serious. We learn and better. Knowledge management's about learning, right? We learn better if we're having fun. So. Looks yeah. like one or two questions slash comments in chat. Okay. 
Just to make sure you see that. Thanks. Let's see what we got. Well, I have to commend that I appreciate very, very much this uh, this conversation, this presentation of uh, Stephanie and Catherine. I enjoy very much, and um, I want to share that I, I for myself, I practice uh, contact improvisation. That is uh, a kind of dance, uh, an Aikido done in practice in silence. And uh, you have to be improvisation, doing improvisation every time, uh, and a kind of conversation with the body, with other people. So, and we are introducing that in our next presentation of the next uh, Knowledge Lab. So I invite to see you the invitation in LinkedIn. <laughs> We're coming to Montreal. We're going to come there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I see a question here from. Dina, um, about an example of arts-based interventions in a professional setting and how they drove creativity. So I use um, scribble drawings a lot. They're just little, they take a little five minute to do. They're meant just as a, to loosen people up. But I've had people in, in workshops and classes and things when I've done the the scribble drawing and it literally is a, a scribble drawing if we had more time i would have we could do one now but i don't think we have quite enough time um and people say oh you know they've been struggling with this um problem this branding problem and after doing this five minute scribble drawing they have got insight into how to solve this problem from you know scribbling on a piece of paper it's literally scribbling on a piece of paper that they probably would throw out after we're done but got this insight of how to solve this problem um i know about a, a km team that set up a studio space in their offices for creative interventions arts-based interventions um that they hosted week-long um, workshops in the in the studio space that they were able to solve problems that they'd spent years staring at screens trying to, to solve. They came into the, the studio and um, part of the problem, um, backing up Kate's stuff on uh, work on discussion and communication um, was communication was was dialogue. The people weren't talking to each other in a in a constructive, useful way. So once they worked on that, then they were able to actually effectively solve problem solve using you know the materials and the, the supplies in the studio to make prototypes to build out the ideas to to solve the, the problems so so everything from bigger to, to small um, but they they've you know solved problems that they couldn't solve any other way so um any other questions here is that good um dina does that answer your question Uh, well, while you're checking in with Dina, we also heard a question from John, which is, do we currently have the AI technology that um, goes back and sort of pushes prompts back to people in dialogue in real time saying, hey, got to have more courtesy, we need to have more inclusion. We don't have that synchronously. The AI models that my team generated looks at historical conversations and the, sees the patterns. It uses transfer learning to go and build a model that can find those patterns. And as a manager, if you don't have money to build out a whole AI model, you can take a transcript out of Zoom and you can just throw it into a spreadsheet and you can code it. You can look and see whether you're seeing a whole lot of declaration disintegrity, or you're seeing a whole lot of translation, or if you're seeing perhaps some of the more, if you will, lubricating acts, you might be seeing some courtesy or you might be seeing some inclusion. So I encourage you guys to do things like that because you can start seeing the way in which at a conversation level, you are generating the possibility for novelty. So there's a question here from Claire about gamification. Um, how are you going to you know, gamification about how you're going to make this fun? Um, and do we see gamification as part of what we've been talking about today? 
or is it different? I would say it's related. Um, there are parts of it potentially that are more, uh, that overlap more with what we've talked about today um, than other parts. Gamification to me includes things like um, leaderboards and things on for websites and portals. That's not so much about what we're talking about today. On the other hand, I have workshops that I do that are about gamifying KM and, and to, to um, show the value of KM. And that gets closer to what we're doing today. Um, I'm thinking about the Bird Island workshop that, that I've done to, to uh, yeah, help people certainly have conversations, but also look at knowledge management differently and understand its value. Um, so I think that something like that kind of game gets closer to to the, some of the ideas that we've talked to today. Kate, you look like you had something there to say. Yeah, I also want to acknowledge that um, a process that Bob Armacost is using is the double diamond framework. And I haven't heard about that for a while. Um, Bob, could you possibly come off mute and just tell us a little bit about that? Bob's still on. I don't know if Bob's still on the line. Maybe we'll do a little bit of research about that one. It sounds like it's also about asking questions. Oh, audio is not working. Okay. Maybe you can put a little bit into the chat to tell us what you meant by that, because that's yet another practice. We as a group should pool our practices because as knowledge practitioners, we've been in this for 20 years. We've had to kind of provoke those novelties. So, and Monica's asked a question about how do we change organizational cultures um, so that they understand the things that we're talking about. Um, <laughs> it's a, can be a, depends on the organization, depends where you're starting from, but I always say start small, lots and lots of communication, lots and lots of little experiments and iterations everything's not going to work with everyone. So, you know, if the first one doesn't work or doesn't work as well as you think, pick another one, try something else and, and iterate and just try and keep trying and iterating. Um, I have a book of improv games that I use with scientists and engineers. They tend to like those better than, than the, some of the more artistic ones. Um, so in doing, knowing your audience and, and yeah, tr just keep iterating be tenacious <laughs> and be passionate um, and persistent and yeah keep keep just trying education 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 anything else here that i've missed yeah and uh, christine also would salute that i was hearing in her comment you know just keep on being aware sort of raising the ante for having the practices, the kinds of things you're doing in the conversation, have them discussable so that people can invite each other to kind of shift the narrative. Oh, and Bob has also just gone ahead and shared the diamond principle. Oh, cool, great. Thank you for doing that, Bob. And Monica has got another question about the connection or the, the combination of KM and innovation. What do you think about integrating these two? I've actually have seen that those two integrated in in some KM teams. Um, the one that I mentioned about doing the studio a minute ago, that was a KM and innovation team that that did that. But I I have known it's it is it is something that's happening. Not everywhere, not with all KM teams, but I think it's a good connection um, and a very valuable connection. Um, if you can move your organization, if if you can't get your organization to do it, then at least partner, you know, with the, the innovation team, because there's definitely a connection there between the two. So. OK, well, we're just over the. The top of the hour, so we should wrap this up. Um, but thank you. Thank you, um, everyone, for your participation and your comments and sharing. Thank you, Kate, uh, for doing this session with me and KMI for, for hosting us and allowing to share our message with the world. Um, thanks, it's been a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, KMI. Thank you for all of your ideas, everybody.
Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Thank See you. you. Bye.